On the second Monday of William's trip, the day before October began, nothing concrete had materialized on his brother. For the better part of the days, he sat around the coffee shop and watched the boys sell kilos of cannabis to an endless barrage of characters. Some patrons bought as little as one gram, others bought 20 or more. A few would leave with a sample of each item from the menu. Customers desiring multiple kilos often had to wait for hours while their orders were arranged with the supply shop. Whatever that was, William knew there were certain things he never learned. From what he'd gathered, hashish was broken at the local level imported to Holland from places like Nepal, Afghanistan, and Katama in the Rift Mountains of Morocco. All exotic destinations he never knew existed. The coffee shop enjoyed a steady influx of people, too. It left little time for idle chit-chat. During the busiest of times, when the line was out the door, the boys would pick up their pace. Like a processing plant, hash, cheese, and wheat was packed, rolled off the belts, and placed into the hands of the consumer. Mano, he was in and out of the shop all day, taking care of various things, as Klaus called them. When it came to trading soft drugs, Klaus and Mano were experts in the art of negotiation, explaining the different products, their values, their originalities. Mano was the clever one. His knowledge of languages, politics, finance, books, and the arts was endless and vast. It also seemed at times that the scholarly gangster could be your best friend or perhaps your worst nightmare. Depending on the mood governed by his Asperger's. The classic Jekyll and Hyde persona. Klaus said it had everything to do with his disability. At quiet times in the shop, usually just before it opened, Mano could be heard clicking those damn pliers. He often went to them in stressful situations, which William found to be quite annoying. The fact was, they hadn't heard anything about Jimmy. It was a strange place to be in all day in the coffee shop. There was constant smoke. People were always stoned out of their minds. And you had to be on the lookout because it was guaranteed that something odd would happen on any given day. Some patrons handled the smoke well. Others fell into fits of laughter. Play the fools. The smugglers always treated the wee tenders with the uttermost respect. But William knew that these folks were probably the most dangerous of all the coffee shop's clients. Mostly, people left with a shot with smiles on their faces. William wondered why the cops never bothered them. He figured that Timon had made some kind of arrangement with the local authorities. Kickbacks, whatever, it didn't matter. He remembered Timon's advice. Do not concern yourself with matters that do not involve you, William. Fimpka von der Waal. Fimpka von der Waal. 
she wasn't making it easy for him either. She would come by the shop four or five times a day, whining to Klaus about everything but the kitchen sink. William didn't know what to do about her. She seemed to always be flirting with him, batting those eyelashes. The subtle hints that she wanted to screw him. The model would disappear for hours on end and then return each time without warning, spewing more venom at clouds. William could see that the rock star gangster was near his breaking point. Check. When Hunt returned to the Bauhaus, the innkeeper said, Mener, I have a message for you. Hunt took the piece of paper, read it to himself, and then turned back to the innkeeper and said with a poker face, Is there a phone I could possibly use? Yeah. You may use the telephone and tobacco and the cafe. If you want, I can make the change for you. Hunt pulled out a few bills, handed them over to the innkeeper. It's long distance to Holland. Do you think that'll be enough? Yeah, more than enough, Maynard. As Hunt dialed Augustino's phone number from the payphone, he cursed his cell phone, which rested in the Gucci, Gucci messenger bag full of money. The damn thing's useless outside of Holland. Everything is settled, my friend, said the Mozambican. You will be meeting a man by the name of Oli Anderson in a place called the Silla Gathen. Augustino gave him the pertinent details of the trip. It is in the north of Denmark, in the Jutland area, a city called Aalborg. Hunt thanked his African friend for everything. I can't even begin to tell you how much I appreciate this. Any luck finding a buyer yet? Obviously not. Otherwise, I would be with you now. Out of this godforsaken place. Hunt let out a single clock. <laughs> Good luck to you, Augustino. Mozambique and clears throat. You understand my brother's fee? Not a problem, my friend. I just hope everything will work for you. You deserve the whole kit and caboodle. If anybody deserves it, it would be you. Hannah and her father decided to stop off and see William at Dykstra 33. They were anxious to find out if the boys had found anything out about Jimmy's whereabouts. Certainly by now, they should have heard something. William said to Hannah, The other day, Manu thought he had to leave, but I guess it turned out to be nothing. i just been sitting here waiting to hear something. I just can't believe that Jimmy left without saying goodbye. We have gone through so much together. I don't know what to say. I guess it doesn't surprise me that he left like that. He always used to pull that stunt when we were young. But 
He would always come back and surprise us later. Like he had a plan in the back pocket the whole time. At that moment, Yash from the bear realized that he had made a terrible mistake. It was the first time he'd done something this serious, i.e. deliberately keeping him away from a man that she loved deeply. She might not ever forgive you if you don't come clean right now. Yash from the Berg had no intention of going to his grave without a guilty conscience. So with great sorrow, he said, I need to tell you something, baby. Anna knew that voice. In a concerned tone, she said, What is it, Bob? Yash from the Berg stared at the floor. was a letter Jimmy s- s- sent you one her father stuttered Hannah's cheeks flared red a bright cherry red what did you say Pa a letter it was as if the devil spoke through her a letter a letter what kind of letter Jimmy wanted you to meet him in Amsterdam and fly back to America with him. St- st- start a new life with him. I j- j- just didn't think it was the right thing to do. You going to America. Pa, I'm not a little girl anymore. You should have given me the letter. Oh no, Jimmy. You must have thought can't be happening. Yash from the bear knew that his daughter was right. I'm so sorry. He knew his apology was meaningless. It do nothing to rid her of the grief that sunk her body. Although he couldn't understand a word, William could see that a serious problem had arisen between the two. All of a sudden, Hannah took off to the bathroom. The big man turned to William and said something in English. Distraught words of connotative help. Maybe you talk to my daughter, okay? What's wrong? William said. Please, you talk to Hannah, ya. Yeah? William went to the back, knocked on the door to the bathroom. Hannah, you okay in there? Go away, William. What's the matter? It took some convincing, but Hannah eventually came out. Jimmy has sent me a letter. He wanted to meet me in Amsterdam. He was waiting for me, William. My father has kept this letter from me. Oh, God. Hannah ran from the room past her father in the smoking area, saying, You should have told me, Pa. When William came out of the back, Hannah was gone. Y'all, Schwann Bear found his daughter at the Bundy's. I didn't lose you, baby. I love you more than you can know. You're all I have left. Anna von den Berg felt the tender spot in her heart open up. 
the one that she'd hidden for all of these years. Right then and there, she knew how much her father loved her, and she loved him too. It's okay, she said. He's seen the spirit from within. I, I wanted to help you, you see. I felt like I betrayed you as a father. I know I stole your childhood. It's not your fault, Pa. My mother had a lot to do with it. Well, I love you, Pa. I understand something. Even if I would have left, it wasn't like I would stop loving you. Although she was madder than hell, she'd forgiven him. Come on, my father said, regaining the happy color between his cheeks. Let's get out of here and maybe get something to eat. This place drives me crazy. Into the cold night they went. Rain coming down in sheets. Quickly they got into the car. Buckling up. Yash from the bear. The old streetcar noticed a suspicious looking car across the street. A black jaguar of some sort. It was difficult to tell. Through the rain, but he thought he saw a man behind the wheel. Looking in their direction. For whatever reason, he felt it odd. To Hannah, with urgency, he said, Buckle up, baby. Something's going on. Hannah turned around to see what the commotion was all about. Saw nothing but a car across the street. She said, Are you talking about the car behind us? In front of the loping dogs? Who do you think it is, Pa? The Jaguar inched forward. F f fucking bastard. He, he wants to f f fuck around with the funding bed. I'll sh show him. In his rear view mirror, he saw the Jaguar's radial tires bounce off the curb onto the street. H -h -h Hold on, baby. Her father rammed the gas pedal to the floor. For a second, he had no control over the car. The wheels spun in place on slick brakes. Her father's demeanor worried Hannah. She had never seen her father act this way with a car. Usually, he was so timid. The Jaguar moved further into the road having none of this problem of his prey. Yeah, he's on my tail. Uh, I'm sure of it. The car didn't move a millimeter until Yash pulled the gear shift down to second. Swiftly, their vehicles picked up speed. He pressed in the clutch and switched to third. Cobblestone's coming at them faster now. Four. Putting some distance between them and their predator. Hold on, baby. We we gonna make this turn. He backed the gear shift over to second, causing the Mini Cooper to roar. It decelerated. Slid the starboard, catching a puck. The big man countered, regained forward with momentum. Straight up new strut, an unheard of speed. I think we lost him, baby. Yeah, I think so, Pa. Hannah said, frightened for the pedestrians around them. Yash 
Josh von and Bear didn't let up for a sack. No, he's still back there, baby. Trust me. At that moment, a large puddle met their tire. Shooting the Mini Cooper sideways. Hydroplaning. Regaining traction. Yash from the bear and his daughter being thrown around like dice at a Yahtzee cup. The Jag called up quick. Yash steadied the car, noticing that the gap between them and their father had narrowed. Oh, tight, baby. Bloody bastard, he said in try to hurt my daughter. He shifted up the third. Green forward, traveling at even more unacceptable speeds on the busy new straw. They were heading for the dike. Pedestrians displayed looks of astonishment. Small children jumped out of the way. Bags of groceries spilled into the air. Lemons, oranges, balls of cheese rolling around the sidewalk like soccer balls. Panic mode now. This was for real. He took a hair grinding right turn onto the Skelter Boulevard and skated at breakneck speed along the dike road. The pursuer did not let up in the least, yet he was a good hundred meters behind them. The big man punched the gas pedal. You've almost lost a little further and you'll be out of danger up the way. He knew the bend would come fast. He'd have to downshift into third when they were done. Okay, you know, baby, we're gonna make the curve in the dike. Hold on tight. As they entered the turn, he downshifted into third as planned. He knew the road well. He'd done this many times when he was in a hurry. But as he did this, he noticed a procession of cyclists taking up half the road. His half. He hit the brakes hard. The Mini Cooper fish out of the sideways. Like a party balloon that's been poked by a pin, the front right tire exploded. The Fondon Barracks had only a second to see the brick wall coming their way. We're gonna get pop with paternal instinct. Josh Fondon Barrack put his arm up to shield his child. Hannah. At 27, knew she had lived a short life. Things could have been different, she thought. She looked up one last time and took in the dike she walked around on as a child. The concrete walls that had always protected her from the ocean. The same walls that would take her life now. It's all over, she told. The impact was loud, a crinkling, spasmodic reverberation of demolition, a hot engine echoed throughout the center. Ted and Ocean listened, 
in her. Yeah. Word of the wreck went through the centrum like a detangling cone goes through wet hair. Of course, no one understood what the hell had happened. Just that two people were dead. Two locals up by the dike near the old swim bag. Augustino heard the sirens from afar, but he didn't think much about the incident until he heard someone walk into Bundy's and say, It's Hannah von den Berg and her father. The Mozon Beacon's stomach turned to mush. As if on autopilot, he grabbed a rag and began wiping down the bar. He hoped that another pedestrian would come in soon and give a full report of the episode. He prayed there was a mistake. He wouldn't have to wait long. A second patron came in and said they hit the brick wall near the old swim baths, the skeleton rock. There's nothing left of the tiny car. The big man, Yash von den Bear. Augustino stood there in shock, listening to the interpretations of the tragic event. Not five minutes ago. Hannah and her father had been standing right here in front of him. Right here. How was this possible? Was he next on their list? Augustino knew at that moment that the rules to the game had changed. And then Dowder, a regular, came into the pub ranting and raving. Man, they fucking ran that hog so hard you won't believe it. The black car following them somehow made it through. I tell you, those damn cyclists are lucky. Augustino thought he was going to vomit. Like opening the door to an oven, the rumor started a progression of heat. Scald of the city. Before long, the townspeople would have many versions of the incident. Augustino thought, and if I don't get the fuck out of here soon, there will be another story tomorrow. Mozambique found dead in alley. Over at Dyke Strike 33, William also heard the sigh. You must have hopped a problem into Centrum, the rock star gangster said to William. Like someone got shot or something? We shall see. About 15 minutes later, Mano Gleason entered the coffee shop with a dejected look on his face. In English, he said, I am afraid I have bad news. William braced himself. This is about my brother. Klaus listened intently. Not to your brother, William, but nearly as bad, I am afraid. Hannah and Josh von den Berg have been killed in auto accident. William's body tensed up. Oh no. Klaus said something in Dutch, which caused Mano to walk over to the window and look outside. What's he doing, William? 
Well, someone out there waiting to kill them. This is what the boys meant when they talked about war. For the first time ever, William experienced full-blown paranoia to the Dutch gangsters, he said. I mean, what's going on? Are we safe? Oh, for fuck's sake, Klaus said in English. With a demeanor not yet exposed to the American, the rock star gangster strutted over to the bar and retrieved the gun. I shoot him in the fucking head. William had no idea what kind of gun it was, except that it was big. Let him come fuck with us. We showed him how to fucking fight, ya. Yeah? Situation has come complex, Nano said. You must have watched your back, lad. As he spoke, two hawk like eyes settled on William. Klaus was livid. Be no negotiation, William. Mano's eyes blinked like a salamander. We must assume that Constantine is behind this. It is not bullshit, William. I fucking killed them all, Klaus said again. Short of pissing in his britches, William settled what nerves he had left. But he was thinking, poor Hannah, she didn't deserve to die. Neither did her father.